So we began this season of Advent with a glimpse into the hope that Zechariah and Elizabeth experienced as John the Baptist's birth was foretold. And then the next week, we reflected on peace within as we listened to the experience of Simeon meeting Christ in the temple. And last week, we were invited to remember and to live into the childlike joy as we followed four angels through the narrative of Jesus' birth. And so this week, we continue to consider another character from the margins of the narrative of Christ's birth as we read about the devotion of Anna and her experience of waiting for fulfillment. Now, whenever women are mentioned in the scriptures, I always pay attention. And it's not just because I'm a woman, but it's because at the time the Gospels were written, especially at the time when Luke was written, the Gospel of Luke, it was a man's world. Women had their place in bearing and raising children and attending to the needs of the men in their lives. So for a woman to be named in the scriptures and remembered, especially when that woman is neither a mother nor is she barren, she must have been important. Not only was Anna named, but she actually has three whole verses dedicated to her part of the story. Three. <laughs> and even so, it's interesting because we have the story of Simeon which preceded Anna's story and we have word-for-word -word accounts of his prophecy and his encounter with Christ and, and well, for the prophetess, we have a summary that she gave thanks, she spoke about the child and something or other about the redemption of Jerusalem. But we know that she's 84. And so it did me to wonder as I read this passage this year, who is this Anna and why is she part of this narrative? <laughs> We are told that she was the daughter of Peniel, and that she traces her heritage back to the tribe of Asher, and Asher was the eighth son of Jacob, and he was born to Zilpah, Jacob's fourth wife, and handmaiden to Leah, and Leah was Jacob's first wife. There's a little bit about her ancestry. We know that Anna was married for seven years, and then she was widowed, that she never remarried, and that from what we read in this little short account of who she is, we get a sense of her devotion. As a widow, Anna would have been free to remarry, but she chose to remain a widow. She was free to return to her father's household, but she chose instead a life dedicated to God through temple service. And she moved into the temple where she was then, where that she then became dependent upon the tithes and offerings and sacrifices of others in order for her needs to be met as she continued to pray and to fast. In God's house. We are told that she was so dedicated that she never actually left the temple, although she would have been more than able to. Um, also, being widowed so, so young, I'm sure she probably was encouraged to remarry, um, especially if she hadn't yet had children. We don't know if she had children or not. But she chose instead that she would follow a life dedicated to demonstrating her love and devotion to God. Her constant state of fasting identifies her as someone in continual mourning, likely for both her deceased husband, but as well as for the people of God. And we are also told that she was a prophet. In choosing to reside within the temple, Anna would have been very familiar with the customs of, and the regular worship that would go on within the temple. She would know about the sacrifices. She understood and would have heard the prayers. She would. Read, she would hear the reading of the Torah frequently, daily. And all of the prophecies that were made of the coming Messiah would likely have been well known to her. And including the one from Isaiah that we read this morning. And the neat thing about prophecies is prophecies aren't a one-time thing. There is an immediate fulfillment of a prophecy. And the particular prophecy you see we read from this morning from Isaiah, the context with which in it, it arises is it's about the, bringing the end of Israel's slavery to Babylon. And this came about because of the Persian conquest of the Babylonians. So now the Babylonians are being chased out into exile. And with this change of power, the Israelites suddenly, who had been forced to leave Jerusalem, were being allowed once again to return to their homeland and to rejoin the remnant few who had been left behind in the city. And under this new Persian rule, 
Jerusalem and the temple in time would be rebuilt. So there is this immediate sense of fulfillment of the words from Isaiah. But this immediate fulfillment is not the only fulfillment forecasted by this particular prophecy. It also has a messianic promise. In other words, it has a promise pointing to the coming of the Messiah. The majority of Anna's 84 years would have been spent waiting for the fulfillment of that messianic prophecy. Unlike Simeon, she waited without having any knowledge or promise as to whether or not she would actually live to see that prophecy revealed. But that day in the temple, that day when Mary and Joseph brought the babe in arms, she knew. She knew she had lived and she had seen the Messiah. As a young mom with two young kids, I can't help but smile when I read about this particular passage of Mary and Joseph bringing that babe into the temple. It would have been Mary's first time in the temple since she had given birth, and it was actually her purification rites that were being required that brought them to the temple that day for the sacrifice of the two birds. And I can imagine that many others in the temple would have smiled at that couple as they came in with their babe. And that they would have been stopped by complete strangers who felt the need to come up and ask the standard questions. Oh, how adorable. Is it a boy or a girl? How old is he? What's his name? Is he a good baby? And there would be all the cooing and the smiles and a lot of joy. But I imagine for Mary there was probably also a lot of exhaustion from all of the interrupted sleep of a new baby. Not to mention the eight-kilometer walk that they'd done from Bethlehem to get them into Jerusalem. I imagine it would have felt somewhat akin to my experience with Anita when I went Christmas shopping for the first time with a four-week-old baby. You step out into this big, busy world for the first time since the arrival of your little one. You've got your list outlining everything you need to do because you don't want to forget anything. You need to get it all done. And every single person you meet has to come up and say something. And there's a pride and a joy as you answer the questions, but also a weariness, especially as you realize that your baby is getting hungry and you just want to get home again before you have to change another diaper because you're not sure now that you may have, may have not quite brought enough. But that day for Mary and Joseph in the temple, as this family is approached by first Simeon and then by Anna, they were, sorry, but that day in the temple, the family is approached by two elderly people who recognized that this baby was like any, unlike any other babies in the temple. As Anna would have approached Mary that day, she probably put on that smile of pride and joy and got ready to answer the, tense, the stereotypical questions. But this interaction would have been different, as was the one with Simeon. Although Anna had never laid eyes on Mary or Joseph before, I mean, she lived in the temple. They didn't live in Jerusalem. Yet she knew her waiting was over. The prophecy had been fulfilled, and she gave thanks. Perhaps, perhaps with the words of the psalmist that we read this morning, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. In that moment, that moment of convergence when she realizes that the waiting is over and fulfillment has arrived, she gives thanks. If Jesus could have spoken to Anna at that moment, I wonder if he would have said something similar to what he said to Peter. Blessed are you, Anna, daughter of Peniel, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. My guess, however, is that Anna's moment of revelation was likely preceded by many moments of doubt. Many moments of wondering if God would really follow through on his promises. Or was this as good as it get? As good as it was going to get? Was the Persian conquest of Babylon to be the only fulfillment of that particular prophecy in Isaiah 46? The original readers of Luke's Gospel may have had similar doubts, as at the time of the letter being written, the second destruction of the temple in 70 AD would have happened, and once again, the people of Israel would have been scattered. 
And today, 2,000 years later, following the birth of the Messiah, which we celebrate on Christmas, we are still waiting for the final fulfillment of the prophecies. Do we believe? Do we still believe that they will be fulfilled? Is the book of Revelation just one last chapter at the end of a book that we don't spend much time bothering with? Because we've already heard the good news that Christ was born and he died and he was resurrected? Or do we actually hope? Do we actually long for the coming of the kingdom of God here on earth? A really good friend of mine said to me the other day, wouldn't it be so much easier if Christ just came today? There is so much pain and suffering in our world. It's hard to look at the news some days. I, I remember, I mean, it's some time ago now, but that picture of the lifeless Syrian child lying on the beach and just weeping and wondering, what could possibly be so wrong in our world that it is so broken? We hear about all sorts of tragedies. Bombings and shootings have become regular events in the news. Natural disasters we hear about all over the world. The, world, the brokenness of this world can be so overwhelming that we can be tempted to just close our eyes and pretend like it's really not that bad. But the brokenness of our own lives may also seep in. Our own pain, physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain, sometimes cannot be ignored. The struggles we face, our losses, illnesses in our own lives and in the lives of those we care about can be crippling. And let's be honest, there's no time like the festivities of Christmas to remind us of the darker, sadder, broken parts of our lives. As families gather together or don't gather, the brokenness in relationships may surface. It is at this time of year that we feel most deeply the absence of those who are not with us. The joy of giving can be transformed into stresses of shopping and pending bills to be paid. And amidst all of this, do we long for, do we pray for God's love in human flesh to return to heal this brokenness? Do we actually believe we might live to see it happen? We desperately need Anna this time of year. We need her story to help us utter the praises of God that simultaneously respond to God's presence and resist the presence of that brokenness. We need her to model the reaction of the convergence of waiting for fulfillment and experiencing that fulfillment. We need her story to give us the courage to trust in our God, who is indeed powerful and present when the world in which we live tries to convince us otherwise. The convergence of waiting and fulfillment, fulfillment with Anna's experience. And each year as we celebrate Advent, we anticipate re-experiencing that convergence. We wait for December 24th when we celebrate and give thanks for the arrival of the long-awaited Messiah. We sing songs of praise and thanksgiving, and yet we continue to wait as we continue to wait for the prophecies to be fulfilled with their final eschatological fulfillment which is a big fancy word for end times that refers to Christ's second coming. We, like Anna, have never received a promise that we would witness that final fulfillment of the prophecies. And yet we are called to live in faith that God's word would be fulfilled. Faith, both Anna's and ours, is the substance of things hoped for, built upon the sure rock of God's word. And amidst all of the troubles and brokenness we face in life, we are called to have faith that the love that was poured out into creation and poured out again in Christ will come again as God's kingdom comes to earth. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you gave you are all to the world. In the bleakness of the stable, love was born that day. Pure love, undiluted, poured out for all who came on your name, for all who call on your name. Such undeserved grace deserves a response in the life that we lead in this advent of expectation. 
Draw us together in unity that we may praise and worship might echo in these walls and that also through our lives. In this advent of expectation, draw us together in mission that the hope within might be the song we sing and the melodies of our lives. In this advent of expectation, draw us together in service that the path we follow would glorify you and might lead us from the manger to a glimpse of eternity. Creator God, who poured out your love, who chose us from our births, we praise your holy name. Jesus Christ, Son of God, who dwelt here on earth among us, we praise your holy name. Holy Spirit within us, present to us from the moments we are born until the, we breathe our last, we praise your holy name. Lord God, we praise your holy name. 